Disc five. Louise murmured, "Monsieur is very good," and dropped her eyelids modestly. We take it then that you saw and heard nothing," said Race impatiently. "That is what I said, Monsieur. And you know of no one who had a grudge against your mistress." To the surprise of her listeners, Louise nodded her head vigorously. "Oh yes, that I do know. To that question, I can answer yes most emphatically." Poirot said, "You mean, Mademoiselle de Belfort?" "She certainly." But it is not of her I speak. There was someone else on this boat who disliked Madame, who was very angry because of the way Madame has injured him. Good Lord," said Simon. "What? What's all this?" Louise went on, still emphatically nodding her head with the utmost vigour. "Yes, yes, yes. It is as I say. It concerns the former maid of Madame, my predecessor. There was a man." One of the engineers on this boat who wanted her to marry him, and my predecessor, Marie, her name was. She would have done so, but Madame Doyle. She made inquiries, and she discovered that this Fleetwood already he had a wife, a wife of colour. You understand, a wife of this country. She had gone back to her own people, but he was still married to her. You understand. And so, Madame, she told all this to Marie, and Marie, she was very unhappy, and she would not see Fleetwood any more, and this Fleetwood. He was infuriated, and when he found out that this Madame Doyle had formerly been Miss Lynnet Ridgeway, he tells me that he would like to kill her. Her interference ruined his life. He said. Louise paused triumphantly. This is interesting," said Race. Poirot turned to Simon. "Have you any idea of this?" "Oh, <laughs> none whatever," said Simon with patent sincerity. I doubt if Lynette even knew the man was on the boat. She had probably forgotten all about the incident. He turned sharply to the maid. Did you say anything to Mrs. Doyle about this? No, Monsieur. Of course not. Poirot said. Do you know anything about your mistress's pearls? A pearls? Louise's eyes opened very wide. She was wearing them last night. You saw them when she came to bed? Yes, Monsieur. Where did she put them? On the table by the side, as always. And that is where you last saw them. Yes, sir. Did you see them here this morning? A startled look came into the girl's face. Mon Dieu, I did not even look. I come up to the bed. I see, I see Madame, and then I cry out and rush out of the door and faint. Hercule Poirot nodded his head. You did not look, but I, I have the eyes which notice. And there were no pearls on the table beside the bed this morning. Chapter Fifteen. Hercule Poirot's observation had not been at fault. There were no pearls on the table by Lynette Doyle's bed. Louise Bourget was bidden to make a search among Lynette's belongings. According to her, all was in order. Only the pearls had disappeared. As they emerged from the cabin, a steward was waiting to tell them that breakfast had been served in the smoking room. As they passed along the deck, Poirot paused to look over the rail. Ah, I see you have had an idea, my friend. Ah, it, it suddenly came to me when Fanthorpe mentioned thinking he had heard a splash that I too had been awakened some time last night by a splash. It's perfectly possible that after the murder, the murderer threw the pistol overboard. Poirot said slowly. You really think that is possible, my friend? Race shrugged his shoulders. Now、oh, it's a suggestion. After all, the pistol wasn't anywhere in the cabin. First thing I look for. All the same, said Poirot. It is incredible that it should have been thrown overboard. Race said, "Where is it then?" Poirot said thoughtfully, "If it is not in Mrs. Doyle's cabin, there is logically only one other place where it could be. Where's that?" In Mademoiselle de Belfort's cabin. Yes, I see. He stopped suddenly. Look, she's out of her cabin. Shall we go and have a look now? Poirot shook his head. No, my friend, that would be precipitate. It may not yet have been put there. What about an immediate search of the whole boat? Huh? That way we should show our hand. We must work with great care. It is very delicate our position at the moment. 
Let us discuss the situation as we eat. Race agreed. They went into the smoking room. Well, said Race as he poured himself out a cup of coffee, we have got two definite leads. There's the disappearance of the pearls, and there's the man Fleetwood. As regards the pearls, robbery seems to be indicated, but I, I don't know whether you'll agree with me. Poirot said quickly, It was an odd moment to choose. Yes, exactly. To steal the pearls on a voyage such as this invites a close search of everybody on board. How, then, could the thief hope to get away with his booty? He might have gone ashore and dumped it. Now the company has a watchman on the bank. Well, then, that is not feasible. Was the murder committed to divert attention from the robbery? No, that does not make sense. It is profoundly unsatisfactory. But supposing that Mrs. Doyle woke up and caught the thief in the act? Well, and, and, and therefore the thief shot her? But she was shot whilst she slept. Huh? So that too does not make sense. You know, I have a little idea about those pearls. And yet, no, it is impossible. Because if my idea was right, the pearls would not have disappeared. Tell me, what did you think of the maid? I wondered, Ray said slowly, if she knew more than she said. Ah, you too have that impression? Definitely not a nice girl, said Race. Hercule Poirot nodded. Yes, I would not trust her, that one. You think she had something to do with the murder? No, I would not say that. With the theft of the pearls, then? That is more probable. She had only been with Mrs. Doyle a very short time. She may be a member of a gang that specializes in dual robberies. In such a case, there is often a maid with excellent references. Unfortunately, we are not in a position to seek information on these points. And yet, that explanation does not quite satisfy me. Those pearls. Ah, sacré! My little idea ought to be right. And yet, nobody would be so imbecile. He broke off. What about the man, Fleetwood? Well, we must question him. It may be that we have there the solution. If Louise Bourget's story is true, he had a definite motive for revenge. He could have overheard the scene between Jacqueline and Mr. Doyle, and when they have left the saloon, he could have darted in and secured the gun. Yes, it is all quite possible. And that letter J, scrawled in blood, that too would accord with a simple, rather crude nature. In fact... He's just the person we're looking for. Yes, only... Poirot rubbed his nose. He said with a slight grimace, See you, I recognize my own weaknesses. It has been said of me that I like to make a case difficult, but the solution that you put to me, it is too simple, too easy. I cannot feel that it really happened, and yet that may be sheer prejudice on my part. Well, we'd better have the fellow here. Race rang the bell and gave the order. Then he said, Any other possibilities? Oh, plenty, my friend. There is, for example, the American trustee. Well, Pennington. Yes, Pennington. There was a curious little scene in here the other day. He narrated the happenings to Race. You see, it is significant. Madame, she wanted to read all the papers before signing, so he makes the excuse of another day. And then the husband... He makes a very significant remark. What was that? He says, I never read anything. I sign where I am told to sign. You perceive the significance of that? Pennington did. I saw it in his eye. He looked at Doyle as though an entirely new idea had come into his head. Just imagine, my friend, that you have been left trustee to the daughter of an intensely wealthy man. You use perhaps that money to speculate with. I know it is so in all detective novels, but you read of it too in the newspapers. It happens, my friend. It happens. I don't dispute it, said Race. There is perhaps still time to make good by speculating wildly. Your ward is not yet of age, eh? and then she marries. The control passes from your hands into hers at a moment's notice. Well, the disaster. But there is still a chance. She is on a honeymoon. She will perhaps be careless about business. A casual paper slipped in, among others, signed without reading. Aha! Uh -huh. But Lynette Doyle was not like that. 
Honeymoon or no honeymoon, she was a businesswoman. And then her husband makes a remark, and a new idea comes to that desperate man who is seeking a way out from ruin. If Lynette Doyle were to die, her fortune would pass to her husband, and he would be easy to deal with. He would be a child in the hands of an astute man like Andrew Pennington. Mon cher Connor, I tell you I saw the thought pass through Andrew Pennington's head. If only it were Doyle I had got to deal with. Ah, that is what he was thinking. It's quite possible, I dare say, said Ray dryly. But you've no evidence. Alas, no. Well, then there's young Ferguson, said Race. He talks bitterly enough. No, not that I go by talk. Still, he might be the fellow whose father was ruined by old Ridgeway. It's a little far-fetched, but it's possible. People do brood over bygone wrongs sometimes. He paused a minute and then said, and there's my fellow. Yes, there is your fellow, as you call him. He's a killer, said Race. We know that. On the other hand, I can't see any way in which he could have come up against Lynette Doyle. Their orbits don't touch. Poirot said slowly, unless accidentally she had become possessed of evidence showing his identity. Mm, yes, that's possible, but it seems highly unlikely. There was a knock at the door. Ah. Here's our would-be bigamist. Fleetwood was a big, truculent-looking man. He looked suspiciously from one to the other of them as he entered the room. Poirot recognized him as the man he had seen talking to Louise Bourget. Fleetwood said suspiciously, You wanted to see me? Yeah, we did, said Race. You probably know that a murder was committed on this boat last night. Fleetwood nodded. And I believe it is true that you had reason to feel anger against the woman who was killed. A look of alarm sprang up in Fleetwood's eyes. Who told you that? You considered that Mrs. Doyle had interfered between you and a young woman. I know who told you that. That lying French hussy. She's a liar through and through, that girl. But this particular story... Happens to be true. It's a dirty lie. You say that although you don't know what it is yet. The shot told. The man flushed and gulped. It is true, is it not, that you were going to marry the girl Marie and that she broke it off when she discovered that you were a married man already? Well, what business was it of hers? You mean what business was it of Mrs. Doyle's? Well, you know, bigger me is bigger me. It wasn't like that. I married one of the locals out here. I didn't answer. Though she went back to her people. I've not seen her for half a dozen years. Still, you are married to her. The man was silent. Race went on. Mrs. Doyle, or Miss Ridgway, as she then was, found out all this, huh? Yeah, she did. Curse her. Nosing about where no one ever asked her to. I'd have treated Marie right. I'd have done anything for her. She'd never have known about the other if it hadn't have been for that meddlesome young lady of hers. Oh, yes, I'll say it. I did have a grudge against her lady, and I felt bitter about it when I saw her on this boat, all dressed up in pearls and diamonds and lording it all over the place with never a thought that she'd broken up a man's life for him. I felt bitter, all right. But if you think I'm a dirty murderer, if you think I went and shot her with a gun, well, that's a damn lie. I never touched her, and that's God's truth. He stopped, the sweat rolling down his face. Where were you last night between the hours of twelve and two? In my bunk asleep. And my mate will tell you so. Ah, we shall see, said Race. He dismissed him with a curt nod. That'll do. Eh bien, said Poirot, as the door closed behind Fleetwood. Race shrugged his shoulders. Well, he tells quite a straight story. He's nervous, of course, but not unduly so. We'll have to investigate his alibi, though I don't suppose it will be decisive. His mate was probably asleep, and this fellow could have slipped in and out if he wanted to. It depends whether anyone else saw him. Uh, yes, one must inquire as to that. The next thing I think, said Race, is whether anyone heard anything which might give us a clue to the time of the crime. Bessner places it as having occurred between twelve and two. Now, it seems reasonable to hope that someone among the passengers may have heard the shot even if they didn't recognise it for what it was. I didn't hear anything of the kind myself. What about you? Poirot shook his head. Me? Oh, 
I slept absolutely like the log. I heard nothing, but nothing at all. I might have been drugged, I slept so soundly. Ah, pity, said Race. Well, let's hope we have a bit of luck with the people who have cabins on the starboard side. Fans hope we've done, though the Allertons come next. I'll send the steward to fetch them. Mrs. Allerton came in briskly. She was wearing a soft grey striped silk dress. Her face looked distressed. Oh, it's too horrible. She said as she accepted the chair that Poirot placed for her. I can hardly believe it. That lovely creature with everything to live for. Dead? I almost feel I can't believe it. I know how you feel, madame, said Poirot sympathetically. Oh, I'm glad you're on board, said Mrs. Allerton simply. You'll be able to find out who did it. I'm so glad it isn't that poor tragic girl. You mean Mademoiselle de Belfort? Who told you she did not do it? Cornelia Robson said Mrs. Allerton, with a faint smile. You know, she's simply thrilled by it all. It's probably the only exciting thing that's ever happened to her, and probably the only exciting thing that ever will happen to her. But she's so nice that she's terribly ashamed of enjoying it. She thinks it's awful of her. Mrs. Allerton gave a look at Poirot, and then added, Oh, but I mustn't chatter. You want to ask me questions. If you please. You went to bed at what time, madame? Just after half past ten. And you went to sleep at once? Yes, I was sleepy. And did you hear anything, anything at all during the night? Mrs. Allerton wrinkled her brows. Uh, yes, I think I heard a splash and someone running. Or was it the other way about? I'm rather hazy. I just had a vague idea that someone had fallen overboard at sea. A dream, you know. And then I woke up and listened, but it was all quite quiet. Do you know what time that was? No, I'm afraid I don't. But I don't think it was very long after I went to sleep. I mean, it was within the first hour or so. Alas, madame, that is not very definite. N no, I, I know it isn't, but it it's no good my trying to guess, is it, when I haven't really the vaguest idea. And that is all you can tell us, madame? Y I'm afraid so. Had you ever actually met Mrs. Doyle before? Uh, no, no, Tim had met her, and I'd heard a good deal about her through a cousin of ours, Joanna Southwood, but I'd never spoken to her till we met at Aswan. I have one other question, madame, if you'll pardon me for asking. Mrs. Allerton murmured with a faint smile. I should love to be asked an indiscreet question. It is this. Did you or your family ever suffer any financial loss through the operations of Mrs. Doyle's father, Mellowish Ridgeway? Mrs. Allerton looked thoroughly astonished. Oh, no! The family finances has never suffered except by dwindling. You know, everything paying less interest than it used to. There's never been anything melodramatic about our poverty. My husband left very little money, but what he left I still have, though it doesn't yield as much as it used to yield. I thank you, madame. Perhaps you will ask your son to come to us? Tim said lightly when his mother came to him, Ordeal over? <laughs> My turn now. What sort of things do they ask you? Only whether I heard anything last night, said Mrs. Allerton. And unluckily I didn't hear anything at all. I, I can't think why not. After all, Lynette's cabin is only one away from mine. I should think I'd have been bound to hear the shot. Go along, Tim. They're waiting for you. To Tim Allerton, Poirot repeated his previous question. Tim answered, I went to bed early, about half past ten or so. I read for a bit, put out my light just after eleven. Did you hear anything after that? I heard a man's voice saying good night, I think, not far away. Uh, that was me saying good night to Mrs. Doyle, said Race. Uh, yes. Well, after that I went to sleep, and then later I heard a kind of hullabaloo going on, somebody calling Fanthorpe, I remember. Miss Robson, when she ran out from the observation saloon. Oh, yes, yes, I suppose that was it. Oh, and then a lot of different voices, and then somebody running along the deck, and then a splash. Yeah, and, and then I heard old Bessner booming out something about, careful now and not too quick. You heard a splash? Well, something of that kind. You are sure it was not a shot you heard? Uh, yes, I suppose it might have been. I did hear a cork pop. Perhaps that was the shot. 
I may have imagined the splash from connecting the idea of the cork with liquid pouring into a glass. I, well, I know my foggy idea was that there was some kind of party going on, and I wished they'd all go to bed and shut up. Anything more after that? Tim thought. Only Fanthorpe barging round in his cabin next door. I thought he'd never get to bed. And after that? Tim shrugged his shoulders. And after that, oblivion. You heard nothing more? No, nothing whatever. Thank you, Mr. Ireton. Tim got up and left the cabin. End of side eight. Chapter sixteen. Race pored thoughtfully over a plan of the promenade deck of the Carnac. Fanthorpe, young Allerton, Mrs. Allerton, then an empty cabin. Simon Doyle's. Now who's on the other side of Mrs. Doyle's, the old American dame? If anyone heard anything, she should have done. If she's up, we better have her along. Miss Van Schuyler entered the room. She looked even older and yellower than usual this morning. Her small dark eyes had an air of venomous displeasure in them. Race rose and bowed. Now we're very sorry to trouble you, Miss Van Schuyler. It's very good of you. Please sit down. Miss Van Schuyler said sharply, "I dislike being mixed up in this. I resent it very much. I do not wish to be associated in any way with this er、uh, very unpleasant affair." Oh, quite, quite. I was just saying to Monsieur Poirot that the sooner we took your statement, the better, as then you need have no further trouble. Miss Van Schuyler looked at Poirot with something approaching favour. Well, I'm glad you both realise my feelings. I'm not accustomed to anything of this kind. Poirot said soothingly, "Precisely, Mademoiselle. That is why we wish to free you from unpleasantness as quickly as possible. Now, you went to bed last night at what time?" Ten o'clock is my usual time. Last night I was rather later, as Cornelia Robson very inconsiderately kept me waiting. Très bien, Mademoiselle. Now, what did you hear after you had retired? Miss Van Schuyler said, "I sleep very lightly." Ah, merveille! That is very fortunate for us. I was awoken by that rather flashy young woman, Mrs. Doyle's maid, who said, "Bon nuit, Madame," in what I cannot but think an unnecessarily loud voice. And after that, I went to sleep again. I woke up thinking someone was in my cabin, but I realized it was someone in the cabin next door. In Mrs. Doyle's cabin? Yes. Then I heard someone outside on the deck, and then a splash. You have no idea what time this was. I can tell you the time exactly. It was ten minutes past one. You are sure of that? Yes. I looked at my little clock that stands by my bed. You did not hear a shot. No, nothing of the kind. But it might possibly have been a shot that awakened you. Miss Van Schuyler considered the question, her toad-like head on one side. Well, it might. She admitted rather grudgingly. And you have no idea what caused the splash you heard? Not at all. I I know perfectly. Colonel Race sat up alertly. You know? Certainly. I did not like the sound of prowling around. I got up and went to the door of my cabin. Miss Otterborn was leaning over the side. She had dropped something into the water. Miss Otterborn. Race sounded really surprised. Yes. You're quite sure it was Miss Otterborn. I saw her face distinctly. She did not see you. I do not think so. Poirot leant forward. And what did her face look like, Mademoiselle? Well, she was in a condition of considerable emotion. Race and Poirot exchanged a quick glance. And then, Race prompted, "A Miss Otterborn went around the stern of the boat, and I returned to bed." There was a knock at the door, and the manager entered. He carried in his hand a dripping bundle. "We've got it, Colonel." Race took the package. He unwrapped fold after fold of sodden velvet. Out of it fell a coarse handkerchief, faintly stained with pink, wrapped round a small pearl-handled pistol. Race gave Poirot a glance of slightly malicious triumph. "You see," he said, "my idea was right. It was thrown overboard." He held the pistol out on the palm of his hand. "What do you say, Monsieur Poirot? 
Is this the pistol you saw at the Cataract Hotel that night? Poirot examined it carefully. Then he said quietly, Yes, that is it. There is the ornamental work on it, and the initials, J.B. It is an article de luxe, a very feminine production, but it is nonetheless a lethal weapon. Point two two, murmured Race. He took out the clip. Two bullets fired. Yes, doesn't seem much doubt about it. Miss Van Schuyler coughed significantly. And what about my stole? she demanded. Your stole, mademoiselle? Yes, that is my velvet stole you have there. Race picked up the dripping folds of material. This is yours, Miss Van Schuyler? Certainly it's mine, the old lady snapped. I missed it last night. I was asking everyone if they'd seen it. Poirot questioned Race with a glance, and the latter gave a slight nod of assent. Where did you see it last, Miss Van Schuyler? I had it in the saloon yesterday evening when I came to go to bed. I couldn't find it anywhere. Race said quietly, You realize what it's being used for? He spread it out, indicating with a finger the scorching and several small holes. The murderer wrapped it round the pistol to deaden the noise of the shot. Impertinence, snapped Miss Van Schuyler. The colour rose in her wizened cheeks. Race said, I shall be glad, Miss Van Schuyler, if you will tell me the extent of your previous acquaintance with Mrs. Doyle. There was no previous acquaintance. But you knew of her? I knew who she was, of course. But your families were not acquainted. As a family, we have always prided ourselves on being exclusive, Colonel Race. My dear mother would never have dreamed of calling upon any of the Hart's family, who outside their wealth were nobodies. That is all you have to say, Miss Van Schuyler? I have nothing to add to what I've told you. Lynette Ridgway was brought up in England, and I never saw her till I came aboard this boat. She rose. Poirot opened the door for her, and she marched out. The eyes of the two men met. Ah, that's her story, said Race, and she's going to stick to it. It may be true, I don't know. But Rosalie Otterbourne, hmm, I hadn't expected that. Poirot shook his head in a perplexed manner. Then he brought down his hand on the table with a sudden bang. But it does not make sense, he cried. Non, de, non, de, non. It does not make sense. Race looked at him. What do you mean exactly? I mean... That up to a point it is all the clear sailing. Someone wished to kill Lynette Doyle. Someone overheard the scene in the saloon last night. Someone sneaked in there and retrieved the pistol. Jacqueline de Belfort's pistol, remember? Somebody shot Lynette Doyle with that pistol and wrote a letter J on the wall. All so clear, is it not? All pointing to Jacqueline de Belfort as the murderess. And then, what does the murderer do? Leave the pistol, the damning pistol, Jacqueline de Belfort's pistol for everyone to find? No. He or she throws the pistol, that particular damning bit of evidence, overboard. Why, my friend? Why? Race shook his head. Mm, it's odd. It is more than odd. It is impossible. But it's not impossible since it happened. No, I do not mean that. I mean that the sequence of events is impossible. Something is wrong. Chapter 17 Colonel Race glanced curiously at his colleague. He respected, well, he had reason to respect, the brain of Hercule Poirot. Yet for the moment he did not follow the other's process of thought. He asked no question, however. He seldom did ask questions. He proceeded straightforwardly with the matter in hand. That was the next thing to be done. Question the Otterbourne girl? Oh, yes, that may advance us a little. Rosalie Otterbourne entered ungraciously. She did not look nervous or frightened in any way, merely unwilling and sulky. Well, she said, what is it? Race was the spokesman. We're investigating Mrs. Doyle's death. He explained. Rosalie nodded. Will you tell me what you did last night? Rosalie reflected a minute. Our mother and I went to bed early before eleven. We didn't hear anything in particular except a bit of fuss outside Dr. Bessner's cabin. 
I heard the old man's German voice booming away. Of course, I didn't know what it was all about until this morning. You didn't hear a shot? No. Did you leave your cabin at all last night? No. You're quite sure of that? Rosalie stared at him. But what, what, what do you mean? Of course I'm sure of it. You did not, for instance, go round the starboard side of the boat and throw something overboard? The colour rose in her face. Is there any rule against throwing things overboard? No, of course not. Then you did. No, I didn't. I never left my cabin, I tell you. Then if anyone says that they saw you... She interrupted him. Who says they saw me? Miss Van Schuyler. Miss Van Schuyler? She sounded genuinely astonished. Yes, Miss Van Schuyler says she looked out of her cabin and saw you throw something over the side. Rosalie said clearly, But that's a damn lie. Then, as though struck by a sudden thought, she asked, What time was this? It was Poirot who answered. It was ten minutes past one, mademoiselle. She nodded her head thoughtfully. Did she see anything else? Poirot looked at her curiously. He stroked his chin. See? Si? No. But she heard something. What did she hear? Someone moving about in Mrs. Doyle's cabin. I see, muttered Rosalie. She was pale now. Deadly pale. And you persist in saying that you throw nothing overboard, mademoiselle. But wh why on earth should I run about throwing things overboard in the middle of the night? There might be a reason. An innocent reason. Innocent? said the girl sharply. That is what I said. You see, mademoiselle, something was thrown overboard last night. Something that was not innocent. Race silently held out the bundle of stained velvet, opening it to display its contents. Rosalie Otterborn shrank back. Was, was that what she was killed with? Yes, mademoiselle. And you think that I, I did it? What utter nonsense! Why on earth should I want to kill Lynette Doyle? I don't even know her. She laughed and stood up scornfully. The whole thing is too ridiculous. Remember, Miss Otterborn, said Race, that Miss Van Schuyler is prepared to swear she saw your face quite clearly in the moonlight. Rosalie laughed again. Oh, that old cat! She's probably half blind anyway. It wasn't me she saw. She paused. Can I go now? Race nodded, and Rosalie Otterborn left the room. The eyes of the two men met. Race lighted a cigarette. Well, that's that. Flat contradiction. Which of them do we believe? Poirot shook his head. I have a little idea that neither of them was being quite frank. Yes, that's the worst of our job, said Race despondently. So many people keep back the truth for positively futile reasons. That was our next move. Get on with the questioning of the passengers? Well, I think so. It is always well to proceed with order and method. Race nodded. Mrs. Otterborn, dressed in floating batik material, succeeded her daughter. She corroborated Rosalie's statement that they had both gone to bed before eleven o'clock. She herself had heard nothing of interest during the night. She could not say whether Rosalie had left their cabin or not. On the subject of the crime, she was inclined to hold forth. Ah! The cream passionnel! she exclaimed. The primitive instinct to kill, so closely allied to the sex instinct. That girl, Jacqueline, half Latin, hot-blooded, obeying the deepest instincts of her being, stealing forth, revolver in hand. But Jacqueline de Belfort did not shoot Mrs. Doyle. That we know for certain. It is proved, explained Poirot. But her husband, then, said Mrs. Otterborn, rallying from the blow. The bloodlust and the sex instinct, a sexual crime. Oh, there are many well-known instances. Mr. Doyle was shot through the leg, and he was quite unable to move. The bone was fractured, explained Colonel Race. He spent the night with Dr. Bester. Mrs. Otterborn was even more disappointed. She searched her mind hopefully. Of course, she said. How foolish of me. Miss Bowers. Miss Bowers? Oh, yes, naturally. It's so clear psychologically. Repression. The repressed virgin. 
maddened by the sight of these two, a young husband and wife passionately in love with each other. Of course it was her. She's just the type, sexually unattractive, innately respectable. In my book, The Baron Vine, Colonel Race interposed tactfully. Uh, your suggestions have been most helpful, Mrs. Otterborn. But we must get on with our job now. Thank you so much. He escorted her gallantly to the door and came back, wiping his brow. What a poisonous woman! Phew! Why didn't somebody murder her? It may yet happen, Poirot consoled him. Ah, so there might be some sense in that. Now, whom we got left? Pennington? Well, we keep him for the end, I think. Ricchetti? Ferguson? Signor Ricchetti was very voluble, very agitated. But what a horror! What an infamy! A woman so young, so beautiful, indeed an inhuman crime! Signor Ricchetti's hands flew expressively up in the air. His answers were prompt. He had gone to bed early, very early. In fact, immediately after dinner. He had read for a while a very interesting pamphlet lately published. Prahistorische Forschung in Kleinasien. Throwing an entirely new light on the painted pottery of the Anatolian foothills. He had put out his light some time before eleven. No, he had not heard any shot. Not any sound like the pop of a cork. The only thing he had heard, but that was later, in the middle of the night, was a splash, a big splash, just near his porthole. Your cabin is on the lower deck on the starboard side, is it not? Ah, yes, yes, that is so. And I hear the bigger splash. His arms flew up once more to describe the bigness of the splash. Can you tell me at all what time that was? Signor Ricchetti reflected. Uh, it was one, two, three hours after I go to sleep. Perhaps two hours. About ten minutes past one, for instance? Mm, it might very well be, yes. Ah, but what a terrible crime. How inhuman, so charming a woman. Exit, Signor Ricchetti, still gesticulating freely. Race looked at Poirot. Poirot raised his eyebrows expressively, then shrugged his shoulders. They passed on to Mr. Ferguson. Ferguson was difficult. He sprawled insolently in a chair. Grand to do about this business, he sneered. What's it really matter? A lot of superfluous women in the world. Race said coldly. Can we have an account of your movements last night, Mr. Ferguson? No, I don't see why you should. But I don't mind. I mooched around a good bit, went ashore with Miss Robson. When she went back to the boat, I mooched around by myself for a while. Came back and turned in round about midnight. Are your cabinets on the lower deck, starboard side? Yes, I'm not up among the knobs. Did you hear a shot? It might have only sounded like the popping of a cork. Ferguson considered. Uh, yes, I think I did hear something like a cork. Can't remember when. Before I went to sleep. But there were still a lot of people about then, commotion running about on the deck above. Oh, that was probably the shot fired by Miss de Belfort. You didn't hear another? Ferguson shook his head. Nor a splash? A splash. Uh, yes, I believe I did hear a splash, but there was so much row going on, I can't be sure about it. Did you leave your cabin during the night? Ferguson grinned. No, I didn't. And I didn't participate in the good work, worse luck. Come, come, Mr. Ferguson, don't behave childishly. The young man reacted angrily. Why shouldn't I say what I think? I believe in violence. But you don't practice what you preach, murmured Poirot. I wonder. He leaned forward. It was the man... Fleetwood, was it not, who told you that Lynette Doyle was one of the richest women in England? But well, what's Fleetwood got to do with this? Fleetwood, my friend, had an excellent motive for killing Lynette Doyle. He had a special grudge against her. Mr. Ferguson came up out of his seat like a jack-in-the-box. Just so that's your dirty game, is it? he demanded wrathfully. Put it on to a poor fellow like Fleetwood who can't defend himself, who's got no money to hire lawyers. And I tell you this, if you try and saddle Fleetwood with this business, you'll have me to deal with. And who exactly are you? asked Poirot sweetly. Mr. Ferguson got rather red. I can stick by my friends anyway, he said gruffly. 
Well, Mr. Ferguson, I think that's all we need for the present, said Race. As the door closed behind Ferguson, he remarked unexpectedly, Rather a likeable young cub, really. You don't think he is the man you are after? asked Poirot. No, I hardly think so. I suppose he is on board, but the information was very precise. Oh, well, one job at a time. Let's have a go at Pennington. Chapter 18 Andrew Pennington displayed all the conventional reactions of grief and shock. He was, as usual, carefully dressed. He had changed into a black tie. His long, clean-shaven face bore a bewildered expression. Gentlemen, he said sadly, this business has got me right down. Little Lynette, why, I, I remember her as the cutest little thing you can imagine. How proud of her mellowish Ridgeway used to be, too. Well, there's no point in going into that. Just tell me what I can do. That's all I ask. Race said, To begin with, Mr. Pennington, did you hear anything last night? No, sir, I, I can't say I did. I have the cabin right next to Dr. Bessner's, number 38 to 39, and I heard a certain commotion going on in there around about midnight or so. Of course, I, I didn't know what it was at the time. You heard nothing else? No shots? Andrew Pennington shook his head. Nothing whatever of the kind. And you went to bed at what time? Must have been some time after eleven. He leaned forward. I don't suppose it's news to you to know that there's plenty of rumours going about the boat. That half-French girl, Jacqueline de Belfort, well, there was something fishy there, you know. Lynette didn't tell me anything, but naturally I wasn't born blind and deaf. There'd been some affair between her and Simon some time, hadn't there? You know, cherchez la femme. <laughs> That's a pretty good sound rule. And I should say you wouldn't have to cherche far. Poirot said, You mean that in your belief Jacqueline de Belfort shot Mrs. Doyle? Well, that's what it looks like to me. Of course, I don't know anything. Unfortunately, we do know something. Huh? Mr. Pennington looked startled. We know that it is quite impossible for Miss de Belfort to have shot Mrs. Doyle. He explained carefully the circumstances. Pennington seemed reluctant to accept them. Well, I agree, it looks all right on the face of it, but this hospital nurse woman, I I'll bet she didn't stay awake all night. She dozed off, huh? and the girl slipped out and in again. Hardly likely, Monsieur Pennington. She had administered a strong opiate, remember. And anyway, a nurse is in the habit of sleeping lightly and waking when her patient wakes. Well, it all sounds rather fishy to me said Pennington. Race said, in a gently authoritative manner, I think you must take it from me, Mr. Pennington, that we have examined all the possibilities very carefully. The result is quite definite. Jacqueline de Belfort did not shoot Mrs. Doyle. So we are forced to look elsewhere. That is where we hope you may be able to help us. I? Pennington gave a nervous start. Yes. You were an intimate friend of the dead woman's. You know the circumstances of her life, if in all probability, much better than her husband does, since he only made her acquaintance a few months ago. Now, you would know, for instance, of anyone who had a grudge against her. You would know, perhaps, whether there was anyone who had a motive for desiring her death. Andrew Pennington passed his tongue over rather dry-looking lips. I, I assure you, I have no idea. You see, Lynette was brought up in England. I know very little of her surroundings and associations. And yet, mused Poirot, there was someone on board who was interested in Mrs. Doyle's removal. She had a near escape before, you remember, at this very place, when that boulder crashed down. Ah, but you were not there, perhaps. Ah, no, no, I was inside the temple at the time. I heard about it afterwards, of course, a very near escape, but possibly an accident, don't you think? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. <laughs> one thought so at the time, now one wonders. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, yes, of, uh, of course. Pennington wiped his face with a fine silk handkerchief. Colonel Race went on. Mrs. Doyle happened to mention someone being on board who bore a grudge. Not against her personally, but against her family. Do you know who that could be? 
Paddington looked genuinely astonished. No, I've no idea. He didn't mention the matter to you? No. You were an intimate friend of her father's. You, you cannot remember any business operation of his that might have resulted in ruin for some business opponent? Perrington shook his head helplessly. No outstanding case. Such operations were frequent, of course, but I can't recall anyone who uttered threats, or nothing of that kind. In short, Mr. Pennington, you cannot help us? It seems so. I deplore my inadequacy, gentlemen. Race interchanged a glance with Poirot, and then he said, I'm sorry, too. We'd had hopes. He got up as a sign the interview was at an end. Andrew Pennington said, As Doyle's laid up, I expect he'd like me to see to things. Pardon me, Colonel, but what exactly are the arrangements? When we leave here, we shall make a non-stop run to Chalau, arriving there tomorrow morning. And the body? Will be removed to one of the cold storage chambers. Andrew Pennington bowed his head. Then he left the room. Poirot and Race again interchanged a glance. Mr. Pennington, said Race, lighting a cigarette, was not at all comfortable. Poirot nodded. And, he said, Mr. Pennington was sufficiently perturbed to tell a rather stupid lie. He was not in the temple of Abu Simbel when that boulder fell. I, moi qui vous parle, can swear to that. I had just come from there. That's a very stupid lie, said Race, and a very revealing one. Again, Poirot nodded. But for the moment, he said and smiled, we handle him with the gloves of kid. Is it not so? Yeah, well, that was the idea, said Race. My friend, you and I understand each other to a marvel. There was a faint grinding noise, a stir beneath their feet. The Karnak had started on her homeward journey to Shalal. The pearls, said Race. That's the next thing to be cleared up. You have a plan? Yes. He glanced at his watch. It'll be lunchtime in half an hour. At the end of the meal, I propose to make an announcement. Just state the fact that the pearls have been stolen and that I must request everyone to stay in the dining saloon while a search is conducted. Poirot nodded approvingly. Ah, oh, yes, it is well imagined. Whoever took the pearls still has them. By giving no warning beforehand, there will be no chance of their being thrown overboard in a panic. Race drew some sheets of paper towards him. He murmured apologetically. I like to make a brief praise of the facts as I go along. It keeps one's mind free of confusion. Ah, oh, you do well. Method and order, they are everything, replied Poirot. Race wrote for some minutes in his small, neat script. Finally, he pushed the result of his labours towards Poirot. Anything you don't agree with there? Poirot took up the sheets. They were headed, Murder of Mrs. Lynette Doyle. Mrs. Doyle was last seen alive by her maid, Louise Bourget. Time, 11.30. Approximately. From 11.30 to 12.20, following have alibis. Cornelia Robson, James Fanthorpe, Simon Doyle, Jacqueline de Belfort, nobody else. But crime almost certainly committed after that time. Since it is practically certain that pistol used was Jacqueline de Belfort's, which was then in her handbag. That her pistol was used is not absolutely certain until after post-mortem and expert evidence re-bullet. But it may be taken as overwhelmingly probable. Probable course of events, X, murderer, was witness of scene between Jacqueline and Simon Doyle in observation saloon and noted where pistol went under settee. After the saloon was vacant, X procured pistol his or her idea being that Jacqueline de Belfort would be thought guilty of crime. On this occasion, certain people are automatically cleared of suspicion. Cornelia Robson, since she had no opportunity to take pistol before James Fanthorpe returned to search for it. Miss Bowers? Same. Dr. Bessner? Same. N.B. Fanthorpe is not definitely excluded from suspicion, since he could actually have pocketed pistol while declaring himself unable to find it. Any other person could have taken the pistol during that ten minutes interval. Possible motives for the murder. Andrew Pennington. Uh, this is on the assumption that he has been guilty of fraudulent practices. 
There is a certain amount of evidence in favour of that assumption, but not enough to justify making out a case against him. If it was he who rolled down the boulder, he is a man who can seize a chance when it presents itself. The crime clearly was not premeditated, except in a general way. Last night's shooting scene was an ideal opportunity. Objections to the theory of Pennington's guilt? Why did he throw the pistol overboard since it constituted a valuable clue against J.B.? Fleetwood. Motive? Revenge. Fleetwood considered himself injured by Lynette Doyle. Might have overheard seen a noted position of pistol. He may have taken pistol because it was a handy weapon rather than with the idea of throwing guilt on Jacqueline. This would fit in with throwing it overboard. But if that were the case, why did he write J in blood on the wall? N.B. Cheap handkerchief found with pistol more likely to have belonged to a man like Fleetwood than to one of the well-to-do passengers. Rosalie Otterborn. Are we to accept Miss Van Schuyler's evidence or Rosalie's denial? Something was thrown overboard at that time, and that something was presumably the pistol wrapped up in the velvet stole. Points to be noted. Had Rosalie any motive? She may have disliked Lynette Doyle and even been envious of her, but as a motive for murder, that seems grossly inadequate. The evidence against her can only be convincing if we discover an adequate motive. As far as we know, there is no previous knowledge or link between Rosalie Otterborn and Lynette Doyle. Miss Van Schuyler. The velvet stole in which pistol was wrapped belongs to Miss Van Schuyler. According to her own statement, she last saw it in the observation saloon. She drew attention to its last during the evening, and a search was made for it without success. How did the stole come into the possession of X? Did X purloin it some time early in the evening? If so, why? Nobody could tell in advance that there was going to be a scene between Jacqueline and Simon. Did X find the stole in the saloon when he went to get the pistol from under the settee? But if so, why was it not found when the search for it was made? Did it ever leave Miss Van Schuyler's possession? That is to say, did Miss Van Schuyler murder Lynette Doyle? Is her accusation of Rosalie Otterborn a deliberate lie? If she did murder her, what was her motive? Other possibilities: robbery as a motive. Possible, since the pearls have disappeared and Lynette Doyle was certainly wearing them last night. Someone with a grudge against the Ridgeway family. Possible again, no evidence. We know that there is a dangerous man on board, a killer. Here we have a killer and a death. May not the two be connected? But we should have to show that Lynette Doyle possessed dangerous knowledge concerning this man. Conclusions. We can group the persons on board into two classes: those who had a possible motive or against whom there is definite evidence, and those who, as far as we know, are free of suspicion. Group one: Andrew Pennington, Fleetwood, Rosalie Otterborn, Miss Van Schuyler, Louise Bourget, robbery, Ferguson, political. Group two. Mrs. Allerton, Tim Allerton, Cornelia Robson, Miss Bowers, Doctor Besner, Signor Ricchetti, Mrs. Otterborn, James Fanthorpe. Poirot pushed the paper back. It is very just, very exact what you have written there. You agree with it? Yes. Now, what's your contribution? Poirot drew himself up in an important manner. Me, I pose to myself one question. Why was the pistol thrown overboard? That's all. At the moment, yes. Until I can arrive at a satisfactory answer to that question, there is no sense anywhere. That is, that must be the starting point. You will notice, my friend, that in your summary of where we stand, you have not attempted to answer that point. Race shrugged his shoulders. Panic. Poirot shook his head perplexedly. He picked up the sodden velvet wrap and smoothed it out, wet and limp, on the table. His finger traced the scorched marks and the burnt holes. Tell me, my friend," he said suddenly, "you are more conversant with firearms than I am. Would such a thing as this wrapped around the pistol make much difference in muffling the sound?" "No, it wouldn't. Not like a silencer, for instance." Poirot nodded. He went on. 
A man, or certainly a man, who had had much handling of firearms would know that. But a woman, a woman would not know. Race looked at him curiously. Probably not. No. She would have read the detective stories where they are not always very exact as to details. Race flicked the little pearl-handled pistol with his finger. This little fellow wouldn't make much noise anyway, he said. Just a pop, that's all. With any other noise around, ten to one you wouldn't notice it. Yes, I have reflected as to that. He picked up the handkerchief and examined it. A man's handkerchief, but not a gentleman's handkerchief. So share Woolworth, I imagine. Three pounds at most. The sort of handkerchief a man like Fleetwood would own? Oh, yes. Andrew Pennington, I notice, carries a very fine silk handkerchief. Ferguson? suggested Race. Mm, possibly, as a gesture. But then it ought to be a bandana. Well, uh, means used instead of a glove, I suppose, to hold the pistol and obviate fingerprints, Race added with slight facetiousness. The clue of the blushing handkerchief, eh? <laughs> Ah, yes. Quite a jeune fille colour, is it not? He laid it down and returned to the stole, once more examining the powder marks. All the same, he murmured, it is odd. What's that? Poirot said gently, Cette pauvre Madame Doyle, lying there so peacefully, with a little hole in her head. You remember how she looked? Race looked at him curiously. You know, he said, I've got an idea you're trying to tell me something, but I haven't the faintest idea what it is. Chapter 19 There was a tap on the door. Come in, Race called. A steward entered. Uh, excuse me, sir, he said to Poirot, but Mr. Doyle is asking for you. I will come. Poirot rose. He went out of the room and up the companionway to the promenade deck and along it to Dr. Bessner's cabin. Simon, his face flushed and feverish, was propped up with pillows. He looked embarrassed. It's awfully good of you to come along, Monsieur Poirot. Look here, there's something I want to ask you. Yes? Simon got still redder in the face. It's, it, it's about Jackie. I want to see her. Do you think, well, would you mind, well, would she mind, do you think, if you asked her to come along here? You know, I, I've been lying here thinking, that wretched kid, well, she is only a kid after all, and I treated her damn badly, and... He stammered to silence. Poirot looked at him with interest. You desire to see Mademoiselle Jacqueline? I will fetch her. Oh, thanks. Awfully good of you. Poirot went on his quest. He found Jacqueline de Belfort sitting huddled up in a corner of the observation saloon. There was an open book on her lap, but she was not reading. Poirot said gently, Will you come with me, mademoiselle? Monsieur Doyle wants to see you. She started up. Her face flushed, then paled. She looked bewildered. Simon? He wants to see me? To, to see me? He found her incredulity moving. Will you come, mademoiselle? I... Well, yes, of course I will. She went with him in a docile fashion like a child, but like a puzzled child. Poirot passed into the cabin. Here is mademoiselle. She stepped in after him, wavered, stood still standing there mute and dumb, her eyes fixed on Simon's face. Hello, Jackie. He, too, was embarrassed. He went on, It's awfully good of you to come. I, I wanted to say, I, well, I, I mean, what, what I mean is... She interrupted him then. Her words came out in a rush, breathless, desperate. Simon, I didn't kill Lynette. You know I didn't do that. I, I, I was mad last night. Oh, can you ever forgive me? Words came more easily to him now. Of course, that's all right, absolutely all right. Look, that's what I wanted to say. Thought you might be worrying a bit, you know. Worrying? A bit? Oh, Simon! 
Well, that's what I wanted to see you about. It's quite all right, see, old girl. You just got a bit rattled last night, a shade tight. It's all perfectly natural. But Simon, Simon, I, I might have killed you. Not you, not with a rotten little pea shooter like that. But and your leg, perhaps you'll never walk again. Now look here, Jackie, don't be maudlin. As soon as we get to Aswan, they're going to put the X-rays to work and dig out that tin pot bullet, and everything will be as right as rain. Jacqueline gulped twice. Then she rushed forward and knelt down by Simon's bed, burying her face and sobbing. Simon patted her awkwardly on the head. His eyes met Poirot's, and with a reluctant sigh, the latter left the cabin. He heard broken murmurs as he went. Oh, how could I be such a devil? Oh, Simon, I am so dreadfully sorry. Outside, Cornelia Robson was leaning over the rail. She turned her head. Oh, it's you, Monsieur Poirot. It seems so awful somehow that it should be such a lovely day. Poirot looked up at the sky. When the sun shines, you cannot see the moon, he said. But when the sun is gone, ah, when the sun is gone, Cornelia's mouth fell open. I beg your pardon. I was saying, Mademoiselle, that when the sun has gone down, we shall see the moon. That is so, is it not? Why, <laughs> why, yes, certainly. She looked at him doubtfully. Poirot laughed gently. <laughs> I utter the imbecilities," he said. "Take no notice." He strolled gently towards the stern of the boat. As he passed the next cabin, he paused for a minute. He caught fragments of speech from within. Utterly ungrateful! After all I've done for you, no consideration for your wretched mother, no idea of what I suffer. Poirot's lips stiffened as he pressed them together. He raised a hand and knocked. There was a startled silence, and Mrs. Otterbourne's voice called out, "Who is that? Is Mademoiselle Rosalie there?" Rosalie appeared in the doorway. Poirot was shocked at her appearance. There were dark circles under her eyes and drawn lines around her mouth. "What's the matter?" she said ungraciously. "What do you want?" "As a pleasure of a few minutes' conversation with you, Mademoiselle. Will you come?" Her mouth went sulky at once. She shot him a suspicious look. Why should I? I entreat you, Mademoiselle. Oh, I suppose. She stepped out on the deck, closing the door behind her. Well, Poirot took her gently by the arm and drew her along the deck, still in the direction of the stern. They passed the bathrooms and round the corner. They had the stern part of the deck to themselves. The Nile flowed away behind them. Poirot rested his elbows on the rail. Rosalie stood up straight and stiff. Well, she said again, and her voice held the same ungracious tone. Poirot spoke slowly, choosing his words. I could ask you certain questions, Mademoiselle, but I do not think for one moment that you would consent to answer them. That seems rather a waste to bring me along here, then. Poirot drew a finger slowly along the wooden rail. You are accustomed, Mademoiselle, to carrying your own burdens. But you can do that too long; the strain becomes too great. For you, Mademoiselle, the strain is becoming too great. I don't know what you're talking about," said Rosalie. "I am talking about facts, Mademoiselle, plain, ugly facts. Let us call the spade a spade, and say it in one little short sentence: Your mother drinks, Mademoiselle. Rosalie did not answer. Her mouth opened, then she closed it again. For once, she seemed at a loss. There is no need for you to talk, Mademoiselle. I will do all the talking. I was interested at Aswan in the relations existing between you. I saw at once that, in spite of your carefully studied unfilial remarks, you were in reality passionately protecting her from something. I very soon knew what that something was. I knew it long before I encountered your mother one morning in an unmistakable state of intoxication. Moreover, her case, I could see, was one of secret bouts of drinking, by far the most difficult kind of case with which to deal. You were coping with it manfully. Nevertheless, she had all the secret drunkard's cunning. She managed to get hold of a secret supply of spirits and to keep it successfully hidden from you. I should not be surprised. If you discovered its hiding place only yesterday, 
Accordingly, last night, as soon as your mother was really soundly asleep, you stole out with the contents of the cash, went round to the other side of the boat, since your own side was up against the bank, and cast it overboard into the Nile. He paused. I am right, am I not? Yes, you're quite right, Rosalie spoke with sudden passion. I was a fool not to say so, I suppose, but I didn't want everyone to know. It would go all over the boat, and it seemed so, so silly. I mean that I... Poirot finished the sentence for her. So silly that you should be suspected of committing a murder? Rosalie nodded. Then she burst out again. Oh, I've tried so hard to... Keep everyone from knowing. It isn't really her fault. She got discouraged. Her books didn't sell any more. People are tired of all that cheap sex stuff. It hurt her. It hurt her dreadfully. And so she began to, to drink. For a long time I didn't know why she was so queer. Then, when I found out, I tried to, to stop it. She'd be all right for a bit, and then suddenly she'd start, and there would be dreadful quarrels and rows with people. It was awful. She shuddered. I had always to be on the watch, to get her away. And then well, she began to dislike me for it. She's, she's turned right against me. I, I think she almost hates me sometimes. Pauvre petite, said Poirot. She turned on him vehemently. Don't be sorry for me. Don't be kind. It's easier if you're not. She sighed, a long, heart-rending sigh. I'm so tired. I'm so deadly, deadly tired. I know, said Poirot. People think I'm awful, stuck up and cross and bad-tempered. I, I can't help it. I've forgotten how, how to be nice. That is what I said to you. You have carried your burden by yourself too long. Rosalie said slowly, it is a relief to talk about it. You, you've always been kind to me, Monsieur Poirot. I'm afraid I've been rude to you often. Oh, la politesse, it is not necessary between friends. The suspicion came back to her face suddenly. Are you, are you going to tell everyone? I suppose you must because of those damned bottles I threw overboard. No, 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 no. It is not necessary. Just tell me what I want to know. At what time was this? Ten minutes past one? Uh, about that, I should think. I, I don't remember exactly. Now tell me, mademoiselle, Miss Van Schuyler saw you? Did you see her? Rosalie shook her head. No, I didn't. She says that she looked out of the door of her cabin. Well, I don't think I should have seen her. I just looked along the deck and then out to the river. Poirot nodded. And did you see anyone at all when you looked down the deck? There was a pause, quite a long pause. Rosalie was frowning. She seemed to be thinking earnestly. At last, she shook her head quite decisively. No, she said. I saw nobody. Hercule Poirot slowly nodded his head, but his eyes were grave. End of Disc 5